In this video, I want to talk about the continuity equation and where this continuity equation comes from. So if you're familiar with the continuity equation, you might have seen it in a form like this, where you have a velocity times an area at point one, and that is equal to the velocity times area at point two. And this VA term, we usually denote with the letter Q, and this Q is called the volume flow rate. So in this video, I want to derive this equation and really get to the bottom of where this continuity equation comes from. Let's say we have a fluid and this is an ideal fluid. Now, if you don't know what an ideal fluid is, I would highly recommend watching the previous video in which I explain what an ideal fluid is. But in summary, if you have an ideal fluid, there are three main assumptions that have been made in order to for us to consider this fluid to be ideal. Number one, the fluid is incompressible. So we're not studying something like a gas, which is a compressible fluid. Instead, we're studying something like water, which is incompressible. The second assumption is that the fluid is non-viscous. And what do I mean by non-viscous? Well, it's obviously not viscous. And a viscous fluid is simply a fluid that has a large resistance to flow. So something like honey is very slow to flow. So we're not studying something like honey. Instead, we're studying something like water, which is non-viscous. So it has a very weak resistance to flow. In other words, it flows pretty easily and pretty quickly. And finally, the third assumption is that the flow is laminar. So we're not studying turbulent flow, which is crazy flow. We're studying laminar flow, which is slow and controlled and smooth. In technical terms, the velocity of each fluid particle all throughout that flow is constant. So it doesn't change over a given time. So off on the side here, let's say I drew a few streamlines. And streamlines of a fluid are simply the path that a fluid particle takes during that flow. So these streamlines that I've drawn here, they're just the paths of this fluid that might be moving from this end over to this end. So you could think of this as a section of that flow. And let's say we zoomed in to just one fluid particle. So let's say this was water and water was flowing this way. Now, if you looked at one single water molecule or one fluid particle, the velocity for that fluid particle, which I'll call V, is going to be constant all throughout that streamline. And in an ideal fluid, these streamlines, so these three different streamlines that I've drawn, never cross. And that is very important to note for an ideal fluid when we're studying the continuity equation. And another thing to note is that this velocity vector is tangent to that streamline. Now, when you have streamlines that are closer together, the overall velocity of that fluid is going to be much higher. And when these streamlines are much further spaced apart, the velocity at that end is going to be lower. So a good example of this is Let's say you went into your backyard and you took out your hose and it was connected you know, to your water pipe and you turned on that hose. Now, if you've ever had an experience where you put your thumb on the hole where that hose is emitting water, suddenly you've made the area in which that water can exit out of much smaller. And what do you notice? you notice that the water starts to move a lot faster the closer and closer you get that hole to being closed. Now, if you removed your thumb from the end of that pipe, you'll notice that the water speed starts to slow down a little bit. And so you can kind of think of this streamline or this diagram that I've drawn here to be very similar. In cases where the streamlines are much closer together, you could think of that as when you put your thumb on the end of the hose to make the hole, the exiting hole, very, very small. So the streamlines are much closer to one another. So the fluid is gonna move a lot faster here. But when you remove your thumb, the area of that hole gets a lot bigger. And so the streamlines are going to be much more further spaced apart here. And therefore, the fluid at the end of that pipe is going to move a lot slower. OK, so let's say we have some sort of an ideal fluid that is flowing in one direction. And let's say it's entering over here on the left side. And I'm going to call this area one and it's exiting at a very large area, which I will call 
area two. Now what I can do here is I can draw streamlines from every point at area one to the corresponding point at area two. Now if I do this, let's say I draw one, two, three, so it's exiting there, and then finally the fourth one is exiting there. So if you can imagine this being a three-dimensional flow, we have two areas in which the fluid is entering here on the left and it's exiting here on the right. And the area at the beginning is much smaller than the area at the end. So this area right here in which the fluid is flowing through is much smaller than where it's exiting. And when we connect these streamlines together from area one to area two, we call this thing a flow tube. And a flow tube is simply a set of streamlines that define where the position of these fluid particles are at one point and another point. For an ideal fluid, just like when we were studying this hose example where the water is moving faster at a smaller area and it's moving slower at a bigger area, we know that the volume of water or liquid or this ideal fluid passing through area one, so the volume of this area one point is going to be the same as the volume exiting area two over a small amount of time, which I will call delta T. Okay, so if that doesn't make too much sense, don't worry. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at area one and area two and see how much volume of fluid is passing through those two areas over a increment of time. So let's say you took a snapshot of this flow tube or the fluid that's passing through both areas, let's say at zero seconds, and then you took another snapshot at one second or half a second later, then you know that there was a certain amount of fluid that passed through area one. And that volume of fluid passing through area one must be equal to the volume passing through area two for an ideal fluid. So in other words, if I drew area one down here and I said over that given amount of time delta T, there was a amount of fluid that passed through that area one, which I will call delta X. So that's just the distance between the fluid passing right at area one and then ending right after delta T, some amount T. That amount is delta X. And if I said that the flow had a velocity entering here at area one and a velocity here exiting area two, then I know that the velocity here at area one is going to be a lot faster than the velocity exiting area two. Why? Because here at one, the area is much smaller. So the same amount of fluid has to go through this area one in order to exit area two. So the velocity at area two is gonna be a lot slower because area two is a lot bigger than area one. So what is this delta x? Well, delta x is just that velocity term, v1 times delta t, right? Velocity times time gives us distance. And we can do the same thing over here for area two. So area two is a lot bigger. And in that delta T time, we know that the volume here has moved a certain amount, which I will also call delta X. But these two delta X's aren't the same. So this is delta X2, and this one is delta X1. In other words, these are the distance that the fluid has moved through each one of these areas over a given amount of time. So again, delta X2 is going to be velocity at two times delta t, right? Velocity times time gives us distance. Now, if I know that the volume of one, the area one, is equal to the volume at point two, then I can set the volume of fluid that passes through each one of these areas or these points equal to one another. So what is the volume of area one or the fluid passing through area one? Well, it's just area times length, right? And the length is this delta x1, and the area is a. So I know that the volume of one is equal to a1 times delta x1. And the same thing goes for 
volume two. So volume two here at area two, that's gonna be equal to area two times delta x two. Now I can set these two of volumes equal to one another. Why? Because this is an ideal fluid and we know that the volume at these two points have to be equal to one another. So I can set A1 times delta x1 equal to A2 times delta x2. Okay, well, what was delta x1? So we have A1 times delta x1, which was this velocity times time. So we have velocity one times delta t and that is equal to area two times, well, this term right here, velocity two times delta t. And you might notice that these delta t terms cancel out. And all we're left with is this a1 times v1, the area times velocity, is equal to a2 times v2. In other words, the product of the area at one times the velocity of that fluid at a1 is equal to the product of area two times the velocity of the fluid at point two. And this is what we call our equation of continuity. So this equation really tells us that the volume entering a flow tube, so this flow tube right here, the volume entering the flow tube must equal or match the volume exiting at another point in that ideal fluid flow tube. And for an ideal fluid, we call this term, this A times V term, we call that the volume flow rate, which is Q. And this is usually in meters cubed per second. That makes sense, right? Because area would be in units of meters squared, and then velocity is meters per second. So when you multiply this together, we get meters cubed per second. So that's our volume flow rate. And for an ideal fluid, the volume flow rate is going to be constant at all points in the flow tube.